It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God when the church has lost its fear of God. They're more concerned about fear of failure than fear of God. When the church has lost its fear of God, they're more concerned about fear of failure than fear of God. They're more concerned about themselves and what they want than what God wants. When we have lost our fear of God, then we have lost our reverence of Him, then we worship. But what do we worship? Do we worship God? Or do we worship our own talents and abilities? Do we worship the music that we have created that is supposed to be unto Him? Or have we actually just entered into emotionalism and, and have a false sense of worship of God? God is not in the music that we sing unless it comes from the heart. He is not in the music that we play unless it's unto him. It's not about talents. It's not about abilities. It's not about what we have, but who he is, that we give him our best. And when we go into the sanctuary and we come in empty and go out empty, we have not encountered God. We have not encountered His Spirit. If we have not had a change in our life, because every time that we encounter God and are in His presence, there's going to be a change in our lives. It may be a subtle thing, but there's going to be. God is always on the move. The Spirit is always moving. And His Spirit moves within us. And when we're not moved by the Spirit of God, then there's going to be no change in our lives. There's going to be nothing manifest on Monday that we said that we received on Sunday. When we went into the sanctuary and we, we were thinking about what we wanted rather than what God wanted, what we desired rather than the desire of his heart, what would make us happy rather than what would make him happy. What would put a smile on his face may not put a smile on your face. Because when you're serving God, when you're working for him, it is work and service that brings glory to him and honor unto him. And he is not wanting us to have glory. He does not want us to make a name for ourselves. It is that name that's above every other name. And when we submit and surrender under that other name, we don't need a name for ourselves. We only need to be positioned in him, not to have a position. We do not need the praise of man. We need the acclimates of heaven, the acclimates of God. We need the applause from principalities and powers of righteousness. We need acceptance from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be able to feel that security that only comes from Him. There is none other. He said there is no other beside Him. There is no other God. There is no other provider. There is no other builder or maker. We can build ourselves, but it will be sand castles built on sand that will not endure the storms of this life. It will not stand when the shaking comes. It will not stand when God pours out his judgment upon the unrighteous. The righteous will stand, the unrighteous will fall. God will provide for the righteous. He is not obligated to fulfill the desires of the flesh. He is not obligating himself to fulfill the desires of the wicked. Those riches may have seemed to increase and people have worshiped people of great names that they have and great famous people with positions. 
on this earth. But God said that the nations are dropped in the bucket. He's in control. He puts them in and he takes them out. And everybody wants to be put in and nobody wants to be taken out. He causes the nations to rise. He causes them to fall. He uses some of these wicked nations to as a battle axe against his own people so that they will be awakened unto righteousness. When we have a wake up call, it means to wake up. It means to arise. It doesn't mean to just turn over. You don't turn over a new leaf. You don't go back to sleep. You don't slumber. He doesn't slumber nor sleep and he wants his church to be alert watching and waiting and praying and seeking God when they're watching, waiting, and seeking. If you are seeking, then you will find, but you may still be seeking. If you're watching, then you're not seeing what you want to see right now. You are still believing, and when you're believing, you will receive. But when you receive, you don't have to believe it anymore, and believers keep believing. They don't pull the plug on their faith because they didn't see the answer that they wanted in the time frame that they wanted it to come. We keep the faith. We have fervent faith, unwavering faith. Faith cannot be up and down. Your faith is up when everything is good and your faith is down or not existent when things are not going right for you or right in your personal economy, or right in your family, or right in your relationships, or right in your marriage, or right in your community, or right in your country, or right around you, that we still have faith, right or wrong, sink or swim, whatever occurs, whatever's happening, that we will maintain that steady, steadfast, immovable faith in God. No matter what comes your way, not height or death or anything, not any disaster should ever cause your faith to be shipwrecked, cause your faith in God to be out the window. You don't throw in the towel. You don't throw God away. He hasn't thrown you away, but I'll tell you what, he's going to make a distinction. The plummet line is already drawn, and those that are on the right side of God will be spared. And those that aren't, they were never saved to begin with. They were never saved because they only gave a commitment when they would get what they wanted, when they wanted it, how they wanted it. And if it wasn't favorable to them, then they found another God. They found another avenue. They found another source. They found another supply. They found another love. They found another Lord. And that is not true faith in God. Faith in God is our connection with him for time and eternity. And our time that we have, good times or bad times and all times, we are to have faith in God who created us, who gave us the very breath that we breathe. Every heartbeat that we have is something that God has given us. Every opportunity that we have is provided by God. Everything that we have comes from a holy God, a wonderful God, a righteous God, a God that loves us, a God of grace and mercy. I'll tell you, the Bible says, God says, my spirit will not always strive with man. We sometimes take for granted the wooing of the spirit of God towards us. When Samson lost the presence and power and anointing of the Holy Spirit, the Bible said he didn't even know it. He just rose up like other times and shook himself. Come on, he went up and shook himself. And there was no power. Moments before there was power. He didn't even know or recognize when the Spirit of God left him. And then, what did he have? He was just a mere man. 
He was subject to every devil, every demon, every God hater, every enemy. He was subject to them. He was a slave to that which he had never been enslaved by before because the Spirit of God left him. It didn't matter that he was called, that he was chosen of God before he was ever born. It didn't matter how much power he had, how anointed he was, how successful he was, or how many people feared him because of the fear of God in him. And he became that. They knew that he had power that was supernatural. But when he didn't have the supernatural presence of the Spirit of God that empowered him, he no longer had any authority, any power, any hope, anything at all from God. He was a mere slave to all that he never feared before. I'm telling you, when we lose the fear of God, when we lose our commitment to him, then it doesn't matter what name we have made for ourselves, what fame that we have been able to give for ourselves, it doesn't matter how many people praised our name, praised our ministries, praised the fact that we had been in the midst of signs and wonders and the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit of God leaves us, that it's more than just Ichabod on the walls of our church or the walls of our heart or the walls and doors of our household or our children or our grandchildren or our communities or our churches or our anything, our countries. It's worse than that because it's not just a name, Ichabod. It's when the Spirit of God leaves us we no longer have that security. We no longer have that power. We no longer have that authority. We no longer have that provision. We no longer have that grace that we have trampled under our feet so often. That word that is a power, it didn't help him then. He could speak all the words that he wanted, but it didn't matter. There was no power in the words that he spoke because God's word is spirit and life. The Holy Spirit left him. The strength left him. The prestige left him. And the fear of him was gone. He was just a man. Will we serve man or will we serve God? Will we serve the spirit of man or will we serve the spirit of God? Will we be filled with our own spirit spiritual desires because man is spirit, mind, and body. So will we be filled up with ourselves or someone else or will we be filled with the Spirit of God? There's going to be a time of great awakening. Two kinds of things will happen. The church will be aroused, stand on their feet, and they will be filled with power and glory the true church of God. The great awakening for them is awake now, you, you that sleep and arise. And there will be a great force of the church arising. At the same time, there's going to be a great fall of man, a great fall of man-made power, man-made fame, man-made worship. The idols are coming down. They're coming crashing down to the ground. They will not have fame. They will not have a name that's sought after anymore because God will not share that glory with any man, any person, any place, any entity, anything, any religion, any dogma, any doctrine. God will not bow, bend, and kneel to it or share his glory with it. It is the word of God, not the dogma of man. It is the do's and don'ts of thus saith the Lord, not what someone else has commanded of others. We only have one God, one Lord, one Savior, one Deliverer, one Provider, one Helper, one Security, one Place of Safety, one Builder, one Maker, and that 
is only God. There is none other beside him. There is no other name. And the times are coming when the name droppers will be severed from those that literally know the power of the name of Jesus. We have to know him. We have to know his love. In the times when nobody loves you, we have to know his grace when no one gives you grace. We have to know the mercies of God that endures forever when no one is merciful unto you. That should not change you. You should never change your mind, but you need to make up your mind to serve God no matter how you feel, no matter what you see, no matter what you hear, no matter who is going to walk with God. You make up your mind to serve God no matter who is on your side or not. The only one that you need to have on your side is God. That he's on your side. And if he's not on your side, it doesn't matter if everyone is on your side. For the majority never is the ruler. The ruler is God. God is on your side when you refuse refuse to bail when you refuse to give up when you refuse to throw in the towel when you refuse to allow your faith to be shipwrecked then it shows if it is where your faith really was if your faith is in god who changes not then you don't have to worry about the changes around you if your faith is in the God that separates the clean from the unclean, you will have faith in his cleansing blood that has sanctified you and made you holy, and you are secure in his love because he first loved you and then you love him back. If you obey his commandments, then you love him. If you don't, then you don't love God. It's same love. If your faith wavers, don't expect anything from God. Everybody can have faith when everything's going well. But did you have faith in God or faith in the wellness? When nothing's going well, have faith in God. The Apostle Paul never gave up his faith when he was in bonds. He never gave up his faith when everyone had forsaken him and he stood there trying to defend himself and God was on his side. God didn't abandon him. Everybody else did. Jesus had faith and was faithful to the very will of the Father when he gave his life for us. Everyone abandoned him. Everyone abused him. Everyone turned their back on him. And he died because that was the will of the Father. He gave up his own will he gave up his own desires and he totally committed himself to the will of the Father. There's coming a time when we will have to make up our mind. Are we going to commit to the will of the Father or are we going to go our own way and do our own thing and fulfill our own desires? Make up your mind. Who is the boss? Are you the boss? Or is God the boss? Are you the Lord of your life, or is he the Lord of your life? Are you the king of your own castle, or is he the king? Is he the Lord? Are you the Lord of the servant? Are you going to serve him when nobody else wants to? Will you stand when everybody falls? When a thousand falls at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, will you fall with them, or will you stand? Will you want to join ranks with the fallen? Will you want to be part of the fear and the unbelieving that has their part in the lake of fire? For the very distinction of fear and of faith is very clear. You cannot have faith and fear at the same time. You cannot have unbelief and faith at the same time. Believers are to be believers. Believers are receivers. When he comes back, he's going to reward us. And he says, is, there, is he going to find any faith on earth? Yes, he will. 
there will be a faithful food. There will be a remnant, always a remnant. And the remnant will stand in thick and thin. The remnant will not bow, bend, and kneel to systems, to false authority. They will not bow and bend to the desires of their own flesh. They will not fulfill them. They will not regard them. They will not go that way. They have made up their mind to serve the Lord and serve his purpose and serve his plan, even if they don't understand it. They still believe. You can believe. I don't understand how that if I turn the light switch on, that you have lights in here. A lot of people understand that. I don't. But I know that if I turn the switch on and there's any power coming into the, the building through the power grid and through the lines and through the receptacles, the lights are going to come on. I don't have to understand that. I have faith that I'm going to be able to do that. And we don't need to understand God in order to believe in God. We don't have to understand his total will as long as we take the steps that he orders for us. You don't have to see the whole picture. You just step in the light one step at a time. You don't have to understand his ways that are higher than yours. You don't have his infinite wisdom. You have what you need. You have enough. You have more than enough. He said, if you ask for wisdom, he gives it to you, but you're not going to be the old wise God. You'll have enough to get through your situation, enough for direction, enough to advise those that come to you for counsel, and it will be his counsel. You won't have it on your own. But if you're going to receive these things from God, you're going to have to have unwavering faith in who he is. If he was God yesterday, Savior yesterday, provider yesterday, Lord yesterday, who will be in that position today? It's up to you to maintain your faith, maintain your fervent faith, fervent love. Unfeigned faith is what he's going to reward. He doesn't want wishy-washy Christians, fence riders, those that are here today and gone tomorrow. He wants the sturdy, the stable. He wants those that are fearless and bold. He wants those that are decisive, not undecisive. He wants those that have made up their mind. And no matter what comes their way, they are going to be a believer. They're going to stand on his infallible word. They're going to hold on to his holy hand they're going to receive from God. They're going to wait on him for renewed strength. They're going to trust him for the wisdom that they need. They're going to take the steps that he orders for them. They're going to be fearless. They're going to be tenacious. They're going to be radical believers. They're not going to be able to be bought by any price. They will not be able to be bribed. There's not enough silver, gold positions. They don't have the spirit of Balaam. There's no covetousness in them because Jesus has become their all in all. And they know that it does not end here. They don't need the silver or the gold. And if they do, he knows where it's at. He knows how to supply all their need according to his infallible riches to be in glory by Christ Jesus. He's the bread of life. He's the fountain of living water. It is a pure stream. He is your peace that passes all understanding. You can lean on Jesus, your peace. You can lean on his infinite understanding. You don't see to understand all you have to do is know that God is in the midst of you in the middle of your mess in the middle of the things that are difficult all around you that he's your place of safety security he's got your back 
He undergirds you. You're on a sure, infallible foundation that will endure. Then he tells us, since my foundation endures, will you endure as a good soldier in me? The good soldiers will endure hardness. No matter how hard, the hardness may get harder. The grief may get greater. The pain may get more. The troubles on every side may increase. And you will have many people disparaging, but you know that you know that you know that you know that God is in the midst of you, that God is your hiding place, the place of safety. He is a refuge for you. He is a high tower. He's your defense. He's your security. He's your provider. He's your helper. He is your undergirder. He overshadows you. He clothes you with his glory. And if that's not good enough, guess what? You're not going to be part of his remnant. You're going to be on the outside, banging on the door, wishing to come into his kingdom when you have not prepared yourself. You have refused that. You knew. You knew the word. You knew it. Judas knew the word of God. He saw the miracles. He was imparted with the Holy Spirit to raise the dead, to cause blind eyes to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk. He was empowered to go forth and do these mighty miracles. Demons ran when he cast them out. Judas. And yet, he lost out. He allowed the devil to enter into him. What are you allowing to enter into you? Let it be the Spirit of God. Don't be drunk with wine for any success, but be filled with the Spirit of God. If you are full of God, there's no room for any other thing. If the Spirit of God is in you, there's no room for devils and demons and darkness and defeat. There's no room for fear and doubt and anxiety. When you're filled with the Spirit, you are full. When you try to put something in a full vessel, it won't come into it. It's full. We need to be filled with the Spirit so full of the Spirit of God that none of this other stuff will be able to enter into you. We give no place to the devil. And how can we stop that? Show the faith that he gives you, faith in God, faith in his word, that shields you from all the fiery darts of the devil. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, because when we come empty for making room for the devil. It's up to us not to make room for the devil. It's up to us to not make room for fear, doubt, and unbelief. It's up to us to make up our mind who we're going to serve, ourselves, other people, or God. What are we going to do? What are we going to bow to, bend to, kneel to? What are we going to cave to? What are you going to believe? This is going to make a difference in your life, in your destiny and the outcome, not only of who you are, what you are, what you have, and how secure you are in these times, but it will define you as part of this holy remnant that he can use for his glory in the closing days of time. For the harvest is ripe, the harvest is ready, the laborers are few, because they don't want to work. They want to receive rather than give. They want the grace and favor of God rather than the glory of God. What does he tell us? That we have come short of the glory of God because of sin. He stood in the gap for you, took the sin, gave you his righteousness. But then he tells you to walk in righteousness. Be holy as I am holy. Separate that which is common from the uncommon, clean from the unclean, dark from white. And the will of God 
and the work of God is in the light, in the righteousness, in the glory. It's not in the world. You may be in the world, but you're not of the world. So we need to make up our mind who we're going to serve. And if we can't make up our mind, it's going to be made up for us. God will draw the line. Where the door will be shut. And those that are in will be in and eat and drink at the table of the Lord and be in the presence of God with his fullness of joy where the outside will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This was not heaven or hell. This is on planet Earth as well. He's our hiding place, our place of safety, our refuge, our strength, our ever-present help in time of trouble. Whose side are you on? Because he wants you to be on his side. But you have to make up your mind. The time for in and out is over. It's time to serve God. It's time to make up your mind. It's time to be holy. It's time to be the sanctified, glorious church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Because Jesus is coming for a ready church, a clean church, with no spots, no wrinkles, unblemished by the world, the devil, darkness. No, the undefeated are the ones that are chosen and elect of God. Amen.